Good morning, brothers and sisters. I wanted to come on here and talk about something that the Lord heavily laid on my heart. I had this scripture in my mind for a couple of days, but on the 12th, it really, I, I just could not get away from this scripture. It just was pressing upon me. And it started as a personal word to me for myself and my situation. And as I began to study it out and really consider what the Lord was saying to me, I realized that there was more, that there was a message for his people. And so I, I come forward to bring forth this message that was laid upon my heart. And the message comes from Ezekiel 24. And in this chapter, Ezekiel is told in verses 2 through 5, Son of man, write down today's date. For on this very day, the king of Babylon has laid siege to Jerusalem. Now speak a parable to this rebellious house and tell them this is what the Lord God says. Put the pot on the fire. Put it on and pour in the water. Put in the choice pieces of meat, every good piece, thigh and shoulder. Fill it with choice bones. Take the choicest of the flock and pile the fuel beneath it. Bring it to a boil and cook the bones in it. Micah also speaks about this in chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, when it says, Then I said, Hear now, O leaders of Jacob, you rulers of the house of Israel. Should you not know justice? You hate good and love evil. You tear the skin from my people and strip the flesh from their bones. You eat up the flesh of my people after stripping off their skin and breaking their bones. You chop them up like flesh for the cooking pot, like meat in a cauldron. Ezekiel 24, 6 through 8 says, This is what the Lord God says. Woe to the city of bloodshed, to the pot now rusted, whose rust will not come off. Empty it piece by piece, cast no lots for its contents. For the blood she shed is still within her. She poured it out on the bare rock. She did not pour it on the ground to cover it with dust. In order to stir up wrath and take vengeance, I have placed her blood on the rock, on the bare rock, so that it would not be covered. The rust here is a scum or a filth, and the word is rooted in to be sick or diseased. Paul speaking to the Corinthians in the first letter to them of chapter 8, it talks about idols. How food is not the matter at hand, but rather the weaker brother's conscience. And because he is without understanding, his conscience is defiled, which means spiritually soiled. And it leads him to sin and die. 1 Corinthians 8, 9 says, Be careful, however, that your freedom does not become a stumbling block to the weak. The stumbling block is an obstacle that drives or urges moves one to sin. In chapter 8, verse 11, it says, So this weak brother for whom Christ died is destroyed by your knowledge. And you can also see Romans 14 on that. This destroyed here means killed, permanent, absolute destruction, to cancel out, remove, to die with the implication of ruin and destruction caused to be lost, utterly perish by experiencing a miserable end. The implication is that if by our actions it leads to causing a brother to sin, we become the cause of their spiritual defilement, the end result being their death because the wages of sin is death. Jesus pronounced woe against the man who snares others into sin in Matthew 18, 7 and Luke 17, 1. 
saying it would be better for that person that leads others into sin to have a millstone tied around his neck and thrown into the sea. That comes from Mark 9.42. In Genesis 9.5 it says, And surely I will require the life of any man or beast by whose hand your lifeblood is shed. I will demand an accounting from anyone who takes the life of his fellow man. Ezekiel 3.20 expounds on this, saying, Now if a righteous man turns from his righteousness and commits iniquity, and I put a stumbling block before him, he will die. If you did not warn him, he will die in his sin, and the righteous acts he did will not be remembered. And I will hold you responsible for his blood. Leading people into error is something that God considers shedding blood. Ezekiel is speaking of the pot being filled with the choicest meats, representative of the leaders that have led people into error. Michael says that the prophets have led the people astray by proclaiming peace, comparing this to them chopping the people up like flesh for the cooking pot, like meat in a cauldron, as they chew up the people of God. God says he tried to cleanse the filthiness, but they would not be cleansed. So now God is turning away from them. Judgment has come. In Ezekiel 24, 16, it says, Son of man, behold, I am about to take away the desire, the beloved desire, goodly, lovely, pleasant thing, longing of the soul, of your eyes with a fatal blow. But you must not mourn or weep or let your tears flow. Groan quietly. Do not mourn for the dead. Put your turban, turban and your straps, your, strap your sandals on your feet. Do not cover your lips or eat the bread of mourners. As part of mourning, as well as one who has been declared unclean by leprosy, which is diseased, it was required to cover the face from the nose to the beard. Leviticus 13.45 says, A diseased person must wear torn clothes and let his hair hang loose, and he must cover his mouth and cry out, Unclean! Unclean! On occasions of mourning, it was customary to uncover the head and place ashes upon it, from Isaiah 61.3, to go barefoot, Second uh, Samuel 15.30 and Isaiah 22, and to cover the beard, that is to say, the lower part of the face as far as the nose. That comes from Micah 3, seven. The mourning could be for the loss of an immediate family member or for the people or for the state of the people of Israel about to enter judgment. Almost the entire world is covering the lower part of their face from nose to chin while wearing masks. It is a sign to us from God, a confirmation of his word, and we have wholly missed it because we do not love the truth of his word. In Micah's time, in chapter 3, he is to declare to the leaders and rulers of the house of Jacob that they are coming under judgment for what they have done to the people in leading them astray. They pervert all that is right, yet call upon the Lord, saying no disaster will come, saying that because of them, Zion will be plowed like a field, and Jerusalem will become a heap of rubble. This is also stated in Jeremiah 26, 18. They cover their mouths because there is no answer from God. Micah says that as for him, he is filled with the power, with power by the Spirit of the Lord, with justice and courage to declare to Jacob his transgression and to Israel his sin. Ezekiel is told that he will lose the desire of his eyes, <clears throat> excuse me, his wife, 
as a prophetic sign to Israel that their dearest object was about to be taken away, the holy temple. God told Ezekiel in verse 21, Tell the house of Israel that this is what the Lord God says. I am about to desecrate, which means pollute and defile, my sanctuary, the pride of your power, the desire of your eyes, and the delight of your soul. And the sons and daughters you left behind will fall by the sword. The sign of this is the confirmation of God's word that he had spoken in chapter 7, verse 22, where it says, I will turn my face away from them and they will defile my treasure place. Violent men will enter it, and they will defile it. <clears throat> the body of Christ is now that sanctuary. Deuteronomy 7.6 says, For you are a whole people, holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his prized, which means valued property, peculiar treasure which has chosen and taken to himself always of the people of Israel. <clears throat> Possession out of all the peoples on the face of the earth. First Peter 2, 4 and 9 says, As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, See I lay in Zion a stone, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who believes in him will never be put to shame. To you who believe, then, this stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word, and to this they were appointed. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, to proclaim the virtues of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Revelation 1, 5-6 through 6, and says, And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and has released us from our sins by his blood, who has, who has made us to be a kingdom, priests to his God and Father, to him be the glory and power forever and ever. Amen. The word desecrate in Ezekiel 24:21 is the same word used in Daniel 11:31 where it says his forces his arm his seat of human strength will rise up and desecrate the temple fortress they will abolish the daily sacrifice and set up the abomination of desolation the daily sacrifice taken away is a reference to Exodus 29, 38 through 39 that says, This is what you are to offer regularly on the altar each day, two lambs that are a year old. Offer one lamb in the morning and the other at twilight. In verse 42 it says, For the generations to come, this burnt offering shall be made regularly at the entrance to the tent of meeting before the Lord, where I will meet with you to speak with you. These sacrifices have been replaced by Jesus, as Hebrews 10 explains. For the law is only a shadow of good things to come and not the realities themselves. It can never, by the same sacrifices offered year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. In verse 5 it says, Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings, you took no delight. Then I said, Here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, O God. Verse 9 says, He takes away the first to establish the second. Jesus' blood is now the continual sacrifice once and for all. 
he took away the first sacrifices that could never take away sins to establish the second eternal sacrifice. And by his sacrifice, it is done once and for all. The scripture says that a body was prepared for him and it's in its first full meaning, it was his physical body, but there is more. Romans 12, 5 says, so in Christ, we who are many are one body and each member belongs to one another. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20 says, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? whom you have received from God, you are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God with your body. Ephesians 5.30 says we are members of his body. Colossians 1.18 says, and he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from the dead, so that in all things he may have the preeminence. The defilement of the sacred place is the people of God, his body. The sacrifice taken away is Jesus, the true Jesus, and the true gospel. How is the daily sacrifice, the true Jesus and gospel, being taken away? How does that occur? In Matthew 24, 9, Jesus says, Then they will deliver you over to be persecuted and killed. And you will be hated by all nations because of my name. This persecuted means aggressively chase, like a hunter pursuing a catch, a prize. Negatively, zealously persecute, hunt down, pursue with all haste. Chastening after, chasing after, earnestly desiring to overtake and apprehend. Because of my name means his cause, his reputation, the manifestation or revelation of someone's character as distinguishing them from all others. Jesus is the anointed one, the savior that saves from sin in Matthew 1, 21. The only atoning sacrifice, 1 John 2 and 2. He is the word of God, John. 1 1 and he became flesh and dwelt among us john 1 14. he is the written word of god come to life the living word the commandments of god personified to break the written law of god by sinning is to break his physical body and sin against him to distort the written word is to distort him. To reject his written word is to reject him. To tread upon with pride and contempt the written law of God is to insult, neglect, treat with rudeness, disdain him and his blood that was shed, the blood of our covenant with God, in the same way. This is what Hebrews 10, 26 through 31 and 1 John is talking about. Matthew 24, 10 through 11 says, At that time many will fall away and betray and hate one another, and many false prophets will arise and mislead many. Because of the multiplication of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. This wickedness is also lawlessness. It means utter disregard for God's law, his written and living word. In 2421, it says, For at that time there will be great tribulation, unmatched from the beginning of the world until now, and never to be seen again. The word tribulation means pressure used of a narrow place that hymns someone in. Tribulation, especially internal pressure that causes someone to feel confined, restricted, without options, carries the challenge of coping with the internal pressure of a tribulation, especially when feeling that there is no way of escape.
many pastors and leaders in the Christian community have already accepted a false gospel, another Jesus, erring from the truth and leading others astray by absolutely distorting the law of God with doctrines of demons. Once saved, always saved. Rapture before any trouble takes place. Saying judgment has already happened. That God no longer heals. The gifts of his spirit have died out. Or that we are ruling and reigning in Christ's stead and we must conquer the seven big spheres of influence in the world so he will return. A false unity where we align with false religions. Some even say that a certain group does not need Jesus because he's not part of their covenant, as if the word of God is no longer part of their covenant. Teaching that God is admiring, lovesick, doting over mankind when it is us that are to be this way towards God. They are telling people to take jabs out of fear although they refuse to acknowledge that fear is the motivator, or a false sense of security and safety to rise up against the government and fight against tyranny, or to trust into an elected official. It is interesting that these things that I have listed all seek to provide options, a way of escape. It relieves the pressure all of which are absolute errors as they stand in diametric opposition to the word of God. It is lawlessness, iniquity, and sin. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 24, For false Christs, anointed ones, and false prophets, someone pretending to speak the word of the Lord and prophesy, but in fact is a phony, an imposter acting as a wolf in sheep's clothing, specializes in the art of misimpression, like about how they were commissioned by the Lord to touch the world with their message. They will appear and perform great signs, which is authenticates the Lord and his eternal purpose, especially by doing what mere man cannot replicate or take credit for. They will also do wonders, which is done to elicit a reaction from onlookers, an extraordinary event with its supernatural effect left on all witnessing it. That they would deceive even the elect, if that were possible, due to the mental stress of not knowing what is the correct way forward at this point. We don't know what the best decision to be made in, in the situation. People are looking for outward sources to provide that direction for them. They are looking for the answers. The false Christ, those that claim the anointing of God, but in fact are false, the false prophets, the wolves in sheep's clothing, proclaiming to prophesy in the name of the Lord, but again are false, are attempting to provide the answers being sought. This is all in the flesh telling people what they want to hear. These deceivers are leading people into more error, and because we do not cling to the truth and uphold it, the word, the error is leading to to more deception, circumventing the discipline and correction of God. These false Christs and prophets appear outwardly in the right season of being fruitful, approved by, and in agreement with God. But inside, they are dead, full of play-acting, insincerity, masking themselves as people who follow God, but have the utter disregard for God's law and His word, and they don't even know it. The false prophet, the second beast that comes up out of the earth in Revelation 13, 11, is described as having two horns like a lamb, but speaks like a dragon. A lamb is a young sheep, so it looks like part of the sheepfold. We are told it speaks like a dragon, and Revelation 12, 9 says the dragon is the devil. 
This lamb looks like the sheep, but when it talks, it speaks like the devil. Jesus told the Pharisees in John 8, 44, You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out his desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, refusing to uphold the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he, spe he lies, he speaks his native language because he is a liar and the father of lies. Genesis 3 1 says, The devil is more crafty, skillful, and well instructed than any beast that God made. He came to Eve in the garden and deceived her. Now, Eve talked to God. She was daily in his presence, yet she fell for the words spoken to her, and she had never sinned before. Somehow, though, we think we are different from Eve and that we could never fall for the deception of the devil like she did. Jesus explicitly told us to see, perceive, discern, take heed against the deceivers four times in Matthew 24. Yet we still voluntarily neglect his warnings to us. Jesus incontestably stated that many will be deceived. The love of many will grow cold and many will fall away because like he said in Matthew 13, 21, they cannot bear up under the tribulation and persecution. We delude ourselves with doctrines that we have the Holy Spirit. We have a new heart, a new mind that thinks like Christ and that we are a new person. When Saul was anointed king by Samuel in 1 Samuel 10, the scripture says in verse 6 that then the spirit of the Lord will rush upon you and you will prophesy with them and you will be transformed into a different person. In verse 9 through 10, it says, as Saul turned to leave Samuel, God changed Saul's heart and all the signs came to pass that day. When Saul and his servant arrived at Gibeah, a group of prophets met him. Then the Spirit of God rushed upon him, and he prophesied along with them. Now we know that Saul turned from the Lord and did not obey him. See 1 Samuel 13, 13. This example should be the warning against this doctrine of men that says we cannot be deceived because we have the Holy Spirit, a new mind, new heart, and are a new person. Yet we want to hold on to those things that make us comfortable and secure, but it is exchanging the truth for a lie. Our covenant with God says that his law will be in our mind and written on our heart. Jeremiah 31, 33. Hebrews 8, 10, and 10, 16. If we reject his law, we are like Saul. We show who our real father is. You belong to the devil, and you want to carry out his desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, refusing to uphold the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks, Lies, he speaks his native language because he is a liar and a father of lies. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Saul had no humility, and neither do we in our willful pride, hardening our own heart against God and his warnings to us. We are the modern day Pharisees. We are taking away the daily sacrifice, Jesus Christ, with these multitudes of false doctrines. It is why the false prophet in Revelation will worship the beast, the devil, the false Christ, because they are just like him. This is not a message of doom and gloom unless we are part of those who remain in error, those hardening the heart, provoking the Lord in exasperation, refusing the kindness that he is graciously providing us. The pressure is about to increase 
And we must have our foundation on the solid rock, the truth of the word of God, or we will not be able to bear up under the persecution. God disciplines his children out of love, and if we allow ourselves to be corrected by it, it will produce the fruit of righteousness. It is my greatest desire to see your soul saved. Deuteronomy 8, 5 says, So know in your heart that just as a man disciplines his son, so the Lord your God disciplines you. Job 5.17 says, Blessed indeed is the man whom God corrects, so do not despise the discipline of the Almighty. Psalm 94.12 says, Blessed is the man you discipline, O Lord, and teach from your law to grant to him relief from the days of his trouble until a pit is dug for the wicked. Hebrews 12.6 says, For the Lord disciplines the one he loves, and he chastises every son that he receives. Revelation 3.19 says, Those I love, I rebuke and discipline. Therefore, be earnest and repent.